I couldn't help but notice that you've clicked on and are presently listening to an episode of the Paranormal Patio Podcast. Thanks a lot. I appreciate your support. And if you want to continue to support us, the best thing you can do is share our episodes on social media. That's right. You can tag us in everything. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can also find us on ParanormalPatio.com, where you'll find articles, links to information from our past guests, as well as, uh, you know, every episode as it comes out. Also, head on over to Patreon, patreon.com slash beyond the patio. You can get a monthly live stream, at least one, sometimes we do more, exclusive bonus content, early access to all of our episodes, and starting with season three, I've got to move season one to the archives. So they'll be on Patreon as well, and you can listen to them there. Thanks again for your support, and uh, hey, let's get into the episode. What kind of weird thing are we talking about today? In this episode, we have a return guest, Martin Shaw from Unexplained Scotland, who appeared back in season two. Go back, look for Unexplained Scotland, give that a listen, come back, listen to this, unless you've already listened to that, then you can listen to this, or you can go back and listen to that again first. I don't really care. Choice is yours, really. The ball's in your court. Martin is here because he has written, published, and is about to release a new book, Unexplained Scotland. We're going to talk a lot about the book, including Martin gracing us with an exclusive chapter reading of the first chapter, and it's terrific. Mostly deals with Aleister Crowley and Boleskine House, Uh, so if you are familiar with that, you'll find something there. If you're not familiar with it, it's also a very good way to familiarize yourself with that topic. I assume that's how the rest of the book is going to be. And you can actually go and read the first three chapters. Just find Unexplained Scotland online. And also you can, uh, you know, check the show notes. There'll be links. The cover art for this book is amazing. You can find it on paranormalpatio.com in the blog post with this episode and these show notes. Or you can find it on Unexplained Scotland's uh, social media, which I highly recommend. And once again, the links will be in the show notes. It's kind of a recurring theme. Also, this episode is sponsored by Dad Bod Pepper Company. They have graciously worked with me to put out a special limited edition version of their spooky garlic hot sauce, and it is fantastic. If you're a member of my Patreon, make sure you get me your mailing address and you will get a bottle of this sent to you at no cost. You know, of course, if you've been a Patreon member for all this time, you can't sign up now and do it. But hey, this is, you know, a gesture of uh, what you can get for, you know, joining up on Patreon. So go to patreon.com slash beyond the patio. But you can still get the sauce in what is left of of this limited edition run from dadbodpepper.com. And there are many more sauces and some Bloody Mary mixes, uh, you know, and some swag that you can pick up from the dad bod. But enough about that. Let's get into the episode. Martin Shaw, you're up to bat. You're listening to the Paranormal Patio Podcast. Welcome back to Paranormal Patio. As always, I am Jason, and I've got a returning guest from the wonderful world of Unexplained Scotland. Martin Shaw has stepped back into the Paranormal Patio. Martin, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me back. This is exciting. I'm very excited to talk to you again, man. You've been very busy since your last appearance uh, on the Paranormal Patio back in Season 2. Can you tell everybody what you've been up to? Uh, Well, I have wrote a book. Also called Unexplained Scotland, uh, I've been working on that pretty much non-stop since the last time we spoke. It's finally coming out, it's coming out from an independent publisher. <laughs> um, I just revealed kind of the first three chapters and the cover art the other day, the response has been incredible. So yeah, I'm going to tell you a bit about that today and maybe do an exclusive chapter reading. Oh, that would be tremendous! Yeah. Absolutely tremendous. So before we get into it though, I have to know... Will the book be available in the U.S. since it's independent publisher of Scotland? 
Yes, it's going to be everywhere physical copies. There's also going to be digital. And I'm thinking about reading the whole thing as an audiobook. Uh, kind of do a soft trial today when I read you a chapter. Oh, see how yeah. I do. <laughs> I definitely see. I've been doing a lot of audiobooks lately when I'm working on, um, if I'm doing really tedious research, like mapping things. I get really bothered when, like, for example, the audiobook I listened to of Terrence McKenna's, um, I think it was True Hallucinations was the one. Like, I know Terrence McKenna's voice, and it's not Terrence McKenna. You know what I mean? Like, he, he's not doing uh, this yeah. one. It's, you know, whoever. Some It's some British guy. And I'm like, this is just jarring enough that it almost takes away from it, you know? So, it would be great, even if it's not you. To at least have someone with a Scottish accent to read it for the audiobook version. I think it'd be weird if it wasn't a Scottish accent. Yeah. People would be really thrown by it. Yeah, absolutely. It just, it adds so much to it. I think that that's uh, definitely the way it needs to go. And if you can do it personally, that's even better because when the author is telling, you know, they're expressing their work verbally, you know, that's, it's hard to beat that. So definitely looking forward to that. So, since you're doing a physical version and a digital version, and possibly, possibly here, uh, the audiobook recorded by you, I think it would be really fitting to give away a copy of the digital version. We can do that by saying, hey, if you share this episode on social media and you tag Paranormal Patio on social media, in the in the uh, post where you share this episode, I will write your name down. We'll put it in a hat, and whoever wins can get a digital copy of Martin's new book, Unexplained Scotland. I think that's going to be great. Yeah, man, that sounds cool. Awesome. So, tell us about this book, Martin. I'm very excited. Well, I think last time we spoke, I was doing YouTube videos where I kind of took unexplained stories from around Scotland. So, it was kind of like UFOs, cryptids, paranormal occult. Told them in my own kind of way, had some funny jokes in there and some pop culture references. I'm basically doing the same thing, but in a book. And I think it's translated better than it did in the video, actually. I feel like I've really got onto something here. So it's a bit different from kind of the regular books you read on the subjects that are, you know, very serious and give you all the facts and a bit kind of textbooky. I've tried to make it a lot of fun for the people that are already into this and pretty accessible to people who maybe would normally read stuff like this and hopefully get some more people interested in some weird stuff that's going on out there. Yeah, absolutely. Anytime you can engage with your audience in a way that instills in them sort of that new way to absorb content, not just your content, but related content, like that's perfect. If you can inspire more people to read because they read something that's written by you differently than other people, then yeah, way to go. Like that's a big accomplishment. Yeah, I kind of hope I can be the start of a slippery slope for people from they'll read this, then they'll read like Mothman prophecies, and I'll just keep going and going until they're deep down the rabbit hole. Deep down with us, way down here in the burrows. (laughs) (laughs) Join us. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. Um, I've picked up some interesting books in the last since well since we've last spoken, and I gotta tell you, man, like uh, every time I pick one up and I get, I don't know three pages in i'm like well there's another book i have to buy oh is there a book on this is there a book on that you know so i've i've been forced down the civil war history um american civil war history because of just a few things that have come up in my research into kentucky and so now i am i'm really deep into historical nonfiction. um and so who knows where that's gonna lead um <laughs> it's just <laughs> it's just a guessing game really i just I have a a big board of of things. I just imaginarily throw darts at it, and like, well, now I got to go there. So, but yeah, dude, I love that. I love that that aspect of it, right? That that inspiration aspect to anything. Because whenever I pick up a book and I don't feel that that I need to find something else, like I I'm probably not going to read something else from that author. You know, I'll take what I can get from that, and then that's it. But whenever I have that inspiration hit, that that to me, is a sign of a, of a well-written book. And I'm sure that we will all find that with Unexplained Scotland, the book. Because I, I do love your style of narrative and your and your storytelling. So, I'm, I'm sure it'll translate very well in the book. I, I'm really excited for it. I hope it'll be good. Um, I reference a lot of stuff outside of Scotland in the stories I tell as well. A lot of them have a lot of parallels with, you know, like the Travis Walton abduction and uh, the Hopkinsville Goblin. 
a bunch of Bigfoot encounters. So it does kind of go global at points where I compare it to other cases and make some comparisons to some stuff that happens. Uh, Mothman, of course, turns up a couple of times. Men in Black are recurring characters. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff in there for everyone. Oh, that's fantastic, man. I'm really, really excited about it. So can you walk us through this book, like kind of just an overview of like each chapter? I assume each chapter is its own, like, you know, independent story, right? Yes. And I kind of thought they were all going to stand alone when I started it. But the more I kept going, there were recurring kind of themes and elements, stuff happening. And then there were like locations they kept turning up. And even a certain character turns up in a few chapters. The one and only Alistair Crowley kind of became the star of the book because he turns up in a lot of stuff. <laughs> Weird how that happens, right? Yeah, either directly or indirectly. He just he's, he just gets his way in there somehow. Yeah, he, he definitely <laughs> that was definitely his M.O. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wasn't going to go there. <laughs> Welcome to Paranormal Patio After Dark. No. Uh, <laughs> the sexual entendres aside, yeah, so what can people expect when they crack open Unexplained Scotland? Right from the get-go, you know, we go in with an occult story, UFO, cryptid, we have poltergeist, demonic possession, witchcraft, you know, it's stories from throughout history, from way, way back to right up to the modern day. And yeah, you know, it's a lot of fun. I try and make it quite relatable. I talk about kind of Star Trek and you know, all that kind of stuff that I love in there to kind of put it in context. So I think people are going to like it. You know, it's a, it's a fun read, but also, I don't know, educational as well, I would say. That's great, man. That's great. Have all of your Unexplained Scotland videos, uh, have those stories made an appearance in the book? Um, most of them have. There were a few that didn't. And I mean, obviously, it's, it's 20 stories in the book. So there's a lot of stuff I haven't touched on on the channel in there. Bonnie Bridge and Zalus, I think one of my first videos that's in there. Uh, that's what? one of my favorites. <laughs> what about the Gurning Man? Has the Gurning Man made it to the book? Oh, yeah. He's actually, he's got a nice little place on the cover. He's towards the end. He's a bit of a, an encore, you know, when the crowd wants some more. Because, oh, that is such a great story. I love yeah, yeah. telling people that one. That, that's one of the ones whenever I'm telling someone in person about it, they're like, are you making this up? I was like, no, this happened. Like, no one knows about it, but <laughs> it happened. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Are you going to go back to the YouTube channel and into the video format? Or do you think that you have sort of kind of driven your work into, you know, more into writing? Um, I think I'm going to eventually. The problem was there was a point where I had like a lot of projects, but I had too many to really invest myself in one of them. So I kind of decided, you know, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to do the book, I'm going to finish it. And then we'll go back to making some videos and doing some fun stuff on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. I really had to just kind of dedicate to one thing for a little bit. So I know it's been a while since the last video. I think the last one was um, I watched an old Satanic Panic PSA as like a Halloween special. <laughs> it was pretty fun. So yeah, I remember that. Ago, but yeah, I'll yeah, be back yeah. to it soon. That's great. Uh, yeah, I'm still a subscriber. I'm still waiting. Um, I'm you know every day I check has has he put anything out today? No, I don't. I don't, but I do look. I have noticed that it has been, you know, it has been some time. And I'm, I'm a big fan of your videos. I, I think I've expressed that several times. And what I love about your videos is just this, uh, this charismatic charm that you have. And I don't know if it's just because you're Scottish and I'm American and it's fun or if it's a genuine charismatic thing that you just have. But I really enjoy just you could sit down and talk about paint and I feel like I'd still be a subscriber. <laughs> <laughs> I should talk about the miniatures I paint. I might get Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There. Uh, yeah. Well, I see you, them though, I see fun. them on Instagram. You know, I, I like every one of them. Yeah, it's fun, man. I definitely enjoy your social media presence for sure. And I, I'm absolutely thrilled to get my hands on this book and you can expect that when the order information is online i will have one within at least the first day as soon as i notice that i'm buying one probably two and i'll give one away but yeah for sure i'm really excited you had mentioned possibly uh you know entertaining us with a chapter reading and i think i'm on pins and needles well i thought Seeing as I mentioned he became a bit of a main character, I could read you the first chapter on Alistair Crowley and Boleskine House. I am all ears. The floor is absolutely <laughs> yours. There's zero pressure. 
there are not dozens of people listening to you right now. Oh, man. Okay, I don't want to do it now. No. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just load up here. <laughs> uh, okay, so I haven't actually read any of this out loud to anyone as of yet. So I am sorry if I kind of stuck at it. But if this goes well, then it'll be a, a good sign for the audiobook. Okay, here we go. Alistair Crowley and Boleskine House. Alistair Crowley, the most famous occultist of all time. If you haven't heard of Crowley, you've certainly felt his influence in pop culture. He's inspired countless hard rock and heavy metal songs, perhaps most famously Ozzy Osbourne's Mr. Crowley. But his influence is felt everywhere in music, from Iron Maiden to David Bowie to the Beatles. He became the archetypal evil wizard figure for film, television and literature. Hardly surprising as he was known in the press as the wickedest man in the world. In the world of the occult, he's still a prominent figure. His books are still sold and read today. He still inspires many to have an interest in the subject. And his own occult philosophy still has a great number of followers. Crowley has been the subject of thousands of books, documentaries, podcasts, web series, and just about every piece of media imaginable. Every piece of his life has been poured over by scholars, followers, and detractors. But it's one specific point in his life we're interested in. His time in Scotland's Boleskine House, and what happened to his abode before and after he vacated it. For those unfamiliar with Alistair Crowley and his life, here's a quick biography of his early years to get you up to speed. Crowley was born to wealthy parents in Warwickshire, England in 1875. Both of his parents were devout Christians, which was something he would rebel against from a young age. It seemed the only part of Christianity he liked was the Book of Revelation. He was obsessed with the image of the rapture, the end times, and demons walking the earth. He enjoyed it so much, in fact, he adopted one of his many nicknames from its pages. He became known as the Great Beast 666. Throw up those metal horns. While he was in Cambridge College, he had two books of poetry published. Both caused controversy for very different reasons. One was satanic, causing a moral panic with the religious crowd. The other was pornographic and was so vulgar it offended just about everyone who read it. With a title like White Stains, I think you'll thank me if I don't go into too much detail about the context of the poems. It was also during this time in college that he made an early trip up to Scotland. He travelled to Glasgow and swiftly caught gonorrhea from a prostitute. After college, he was put in touch with the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn by a friend after discussing his interest in alchemy, the mystical art of transforming matter. The Golden Dawn was a magical society dedicated to the study and practice of the occult, the paranormal and magic. Magic spelt with a CK rather than just a C, so you know it's the real deal. Crowley took to this group with an unprecedented enthusiasm and within two years he was a leading member. Crowley wanted to fervor his magical training, however, and was feeling held back by the rules and hierarchy of the Golden Dawn. He chose to perform a ritual from the Book of Abra Melon, a grimoire written by an Egyptian mage in the 1400s. Not only had no one attempted anything from this book in centuries, its preface specifically tells the reader not to attempt anything within it, much like the introduction to Jackass. Crowley, never one to follow rules or listen to warnings, decided to try it anyway, much like hundreds of teenagers after seeing Johnny Knoxville attach fireworks to his roller skates. To perform his chosen ritual, he needed a location with very specific specifications. He needed a home that would provide enough solitude and privacy for intense and lengthy meditation. The home needed a north-facing door. The door needed to open onto a terrace covered in sand. At the end of the terrace, there needed to be a lodge in which evil spirits could be summoned, gathered, and bound. Crowley searched long and hard for the perfect location, believing he would perhaps find it in the Lake District. After being unsuccessful here, he decided to look elsewhere. This brought him, finally, to Scotland. Along the shores of Loch Ness, famous for a different type of monster, Crowley found the perfect place, Boleskine House. Boleskine already had a strange history before Crowley even set foot in it. On this location was originally Boleskine Parish, built in the 13th century. In the 1600s, it was said that a minister of the parish was given the job of killing zombies raised from the graveyard by an evil warlock. A priest's duties used to be very different. The parish later, according to legend, burned down with his entire congregation inside, killing them all. Whether this was the work of the evil warlock or just an unattended kettle is unknown. Boleskin House was built on the same land to be used as a hunting lodge in 1760. This was the building that Crowley came to. It had a north-facing door that led onto a terrace that went straight to a lodge. As for the sand, Crowley could just take some from the nearby loch. Crowley was so sure that this was the perfect location that in 1899 he, being the master negotiator, paid twice the asking price and moved in. Soon after arriving at Boleskin, Crowley started to prayer for his ritual. The purpose of the ritual was to invoke his guardian angel and obtain mystical knowledge from it. 
The knowledge given would result in Crowley being gifted more power as a magician and a greater understanding of the occult. Performing the ritual was to be no easy task, though. To begin with, Crowley had to abstain from sex, drugs and alcohol for six months. No easy feat, as these were three of Crowley's favourite things in the whole wide world. Crowley then had to meditate before sunrise and after sunset. This was also a challenge, and I can't picture Crowley as a morning person. While abstaining and meditating, he also had to spend his time in near total isolation. Very hard for a man who famously loved attention. Once this initial part of the ritual was complete, the difficulty level increased with the next step. Next, Crowley had to summon the twelve kings and dukes of hell. This included Baal, who has the head of a man, the head of a cat, and the head of a frog. Person, who appears as a man with the face of a lion riding a bear. And Amdusius, who is a man with claws and the head of a unicorn. The purpose of this was to bind the demonic kings and dukes to the lodge on the property, removing their negative influence from his life. These demons would also grant Crowley certain powers such as levitation, the ability to predict the future, invisibility, and the incredibly useful power to bend trees at will, to name just a few. Along with these demons, he'd also be summoning their personal legions of lesser demons who served them. During his time preparing for and performing the ritual, locals became curious as to what Crowley was doing in Boleskin. His reputation certainly preceded him, and the locals knew that the man who had just moved into their neighbourhood was a black magician, an occultist, a sexual deviant, and the wickedest man in the world. It wasn't long until tales regarding Crowley's activities in Boleskin started flying wild. Rumours of unnamed locals getting a look through a window and seeing Crowley leading satanic black masses, performing evil occult rituals with a legion of cloaked disciples, and more scenes straight out of a Dennis Wheatley novel quickly spread through the area like wildfire. Given Mr. Crowley's history and reputation, these rumours aren't totally ridiculous. However, judging by his dedication to the isolation he did perform his ritual, I think it's safe to assume these rumours were just tall tales made up in the local pub. That's not to say that strange things weren't happening in and around Boleskine House. By Crowley's own account of his time in the house, he was perhaps too successful in summoning the kings and dukes of hell to come and live in his lodge. He puts the weird events of this time down to his unprecedented success and even said things did get out of hand. Something of an understatement. Crowley claims a workman on his land became deranged and attempted to murder him. His coachman, a sober man, got drunk and tried to kill his own family. The two children of Crowley's housekeeper died suddenly and abruptly. Perhaps the strangest of all was when Crowley absentmindedly noted down some demons' names on a butcher's receipt that he mistook for a scrap piece of paper. Later, the butcher he received the receipt from slipped while cutting meat for a customer, severed an artery and bled to death. Locals became so afraid of Crowley that some eventually tried to win his favour by leaving a homemade illegal bottle of whiskey on his doorstep. They believed Crowley had control over the forces he had summoned when he was actually letting them run amok. He did keep the whiskey to enjoy later, though. Crowley had almost completed the ritual. He had abstained and meditated for six months. He had summoned and bound the twelve kings and dukes of hell and bound them to the lodge. He decided it was finally time to take the final step and summon his guardian angel. As he was preparing to do this, though, he was suddenly called back to the Golden Dawn. The magical society was experiencing infighting and was on the verge of imploding and tearing itself apart. Crowley abandoned the ritual and quickly travelled to Paris to try and help save his group. He never returned to Boleskin. He never finished the ritual here. He never banished the demons he summons. He just left them for the next owner to deal with, like an old couch. After abandoning Boleskin, Crowley would eventually leave the Golden Dawn and create his own magical and occult society slash philosophy known as Philema. He set up an abbey in Sicily where he and several of his followers lived. After learning of the sordid activities that took place in the Abbey and the death of one of his followers due to a liver infection, the dictator Mussolini deported Crowley. The Abbey closed down shortly after. How bad do you have to be to make Mussolini kick you out? Crowley eventually died a penniless drug addict in a nursing home in England in 1947. He never got to see the massive influence he would have that began just over a decade later. Although Crowley had left Boleskin, the story of the property would continue without him. Boleskin lay empty for some years until Crowley finally sold it in 1913. Shortly after the First World War, Boleskin, or rather the land Boleskin was built on, was involved in a scam involving shares in a non-existent pig farm. Whether this was the result of Crowley's magic or demons he summoned is up for debate. In 1965, Boleskin had his next proper resident. An army major moved in, but soon after shot himself in Crowley's old bedroom. Next, a married couple moved in. The husband broke up with his wife and moved out after only one month. The wife was blind and was left wandering around her home unable to see. In 1970, Boleskin had its next and perhaps most famous owner, 
Jimmy Page, guitarist for Led Zeppelin, bought the Leskin house and intended to return it to the condition it would have been in while Crowley lived there. In the years it was unoccupied, the Leskin had fallen into disrepair and required a lot of work. Page was a big fan of the occult and Crowley in particular. He thought the Leskin would make a good holiday home and an inspiring place to write new music. Page only visited a handful of times. He was reportedly put off the property's holiday home potential when he heard a ghostly severed head rolling across the floor. Page decided to ask his friend Malcolm Dent to act as a caretaker for Boleskine while he was away on tour slash afraid to return due to disembodied head rolling about. Dent, doing not much of anything else at the time, agreed and moved in. He ended up staying for two decades. Soon after moving in, Dent started to repair Boleskine. He worked on the interior which had been ravaged by a fire at some unknown point in its disuse and landscaped the surrounding area which had become overgrown and jungle-like. Dent was a sceptic towards all things paranormal, but soon after starting his work on Boleskine, things began to happen that he couldn't explain. He would hear strange noises in the rooms and halls that would stop when he went to investigate them, then start again when he left. Doors would slam around the house during the night for no reason. He would go into rooms and find carpets, rugs and other items piled up in the centre. He also experienced what he called the most terrifying night of his life in Boleskine. He was awoken one night to strange sounds outside of his bedroom door. As he listened, the sounds seemed to get closer and closer to his room. He described the sounds as strange grunting and scraping, like they were coming from a large wild animal. Then stayed up all night, too terrified to open his door. He was thinking some sort of wolf or wild boar had somehow gotten into the house. When the morning came, the noises stopped and Dent dared to look outside his bedroom door. There was nothing there and there was no sign that anything had been there. And it wasn't just Dent experiencing strange things at Boleskin. A friend of his, while staying over, claimed she was attacked by some sort of devil. None of this ever seemed to bother Dent, however. Whenever strange things would happen, he would just say, that's just Alistair doing his thing. The only thing that did seem to bother Dent were the constant visitors to the property who were fans of Led Zeppelin or Crowley, proving that classic rock fans and occult nerds are far more annoying than any demon or ghost. Page eventually sold Boleskine in 1992 and Dent moved out. The property was bought and sold a few times, usually to be used as a guest house or B&B. In 2015, while its owners were out, the property caught fire. 60% of the building was destroyed and Boleskine was rendered uninhabitable. A few years later, a foundation bought what remained of Boleskine and planned to rebuild it. That was until 2019, when it caught fire again. At the time of writing this, Boleskins remain still lay empty, although there are recent plans to once again open it, attempt to rebuild it, and open it as an Airbnb, perhaps with a leaning towards occult tourism. While this is appealing to modern Thelemites, fans of the occult, and dark tourists, whether or not it's a good idea is up for debate. If the Twelve Kings and Dukes of Hell are still bound to Boleskin House, I'm sure they will appreciate the new company after so long alone. But will they sit quietly and play nice with their new visitors, or will they return to wreaking the same havoc they did as when Crowley summoned them? Surely the influx of occultists visiting will result in them performing rituals. Rituals which might stir up the old demons. Boleskine House and the land it's built on seems destined for the paranormal. From zombie attacks to congregation killing fires to Crowley summoning the forces of hell to more recent blazes, it seems like this is one of those places on the thin part of the veil between here and some other dimension where the supernatural dwells. Is it pure coincidence that it's where Crowley chose to perform his Abermellum ritual, a house that matched his very specific needs while also having such a bizarre history? Is it possible that Crowley was drawn to this place by whatever entity or entities dwelled on the land, and the knowledge that Crowley's ritual would open the veil between our world and theirs even more, allowing them more power here? A plan that went awry when Crowley suddenly had to depart, leaving these entities or kings and dukes of hell in a kind of limbo bound to Boleskine House? Were they made more powerful by the ritual, but trapped by its abandonment and unable to leave the property? Were they attempting to use Crowley for their own means, only to be betrayed and left in an old, empty house? Were they left for decades in a strange half-life, only able to torment and terrify the residents who dwelled there, waiting for someone to return who could finish the ritual and release them? Was it them who tried to burn the place down, perhaps in an attempt to escape their imprisonment? Whatever the future holds for Boleskine House and the land it stands on, I think it's safe to assume that more strangeness is to come. If the plans to rebuild and reopen go ahead this time, this might be the first B&B with the rules. No noise after ten, no smoking, no summoning the forces of hell. And that's the first chapter. <laughs> Thank you. I love it, man. Absolutely. I am there. I'm, I'm 100% in line. I have my tent in the parking lot. Like it's Black Friday. I'm ready to punch an old woman. <laughs> 
to get the first copy of of the book. I'm I'm absolutely thrilled, man. It was that's great. Great job. That's the first time I've I've read it like out loud to someone. So uh, I, I hope that was okay. It felt good. It felt. Oh good. yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, great content, and you absolutely were able to sort of put your personal spin. You know. The the one line that still has me uh, amused is the incredibly useful power to bend trees at will. <laughs> just, <laughs> just yeah. terrific, absolutely terrific, man. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for the exclusive no chapter the reading. What are you doing right now? Like you've just finished this book, you're getting ready to launch it. You know, you've taken a break from YouTube. I I, know, I mean, I know kind of, you know, some of your hobbies just from uh, social media and everything. But for those who don't, like, what what are you up to now? Are you just taking a break and relaxing? Yeah, I'm just kind of chilling out. Um, I've been painting some miniatures. I've been collecting records. Uh, yeah, I've been finding some cool toads out in the wild. That's always fun. <laughs> I'm a simple guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, mainly it's been book stuff, you know. Um, we've been getting some proof copies printed off that we're waiting for just to see how the format looks and how the art looks on um, like the printed cover. Yeah. So we're going to have some pictures of that up soon, um, definitely before kind of the pre-order start. So that'll, that's the big thing that should be happening pretty soon. Awesome. When do you expect the book will be available to purchase? Well, I think the pre-order will probably be just before the end of the month. And that's going to last, I believe, about two weeks. Cool. And then once that's done, we'll start printing them. And that should hopefully be a pretty quick process. And then they'll be out. Yeah. Available for everyone to read. And then, of course, they'll be in um, the store as well, which you can just buy at any time. Are you going to do any signed copies? I'm going to do as many signed copies as I can. That would be terrific. Yeah. You could, uh, you know, put them up on uh, on YouTube, put an announcement up or whatever, have people buy a, a pre-order signed copy from you or something like that. It would be great. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know exactly how the printing is going to work or if I'll, I'll need to go somewhere to sign them before they're sent off, but I'm going to do all I can to sign and uh, write little notes to everyone. Yeah, yeah. Keep me updated because that's what I want. So uh, I'm really hoping. Um, I hope I, I have to sign a whole lot. That would be really fun. That would be <laughs> awesome. Absolutely awesome. Well, outside of the book and and the hobbies, what's your what's your next project? I've started working on Unexplained Scotland, Volume Two. Oh no! <laughs> Sequel in the works. Oh man, we're full of exclusives here today. Oh yeah. Is it going to be more of the same? You have more just stories, or you do change the format up. What's what's the second book looking like? More stories, um, some that are a bit more, oh, I suppose, deep cut. Some that a lot of people won't have heard of, like in Unexplained Scotland. There's a few, you know, people might have heard of, but a lot that go a bit under the radar. The volume two goes even deeper, even further. A lot of stuff that was quite difficult to research just because of the amount of information out there. But yeah, I've been getting quite deep into some of it. Uh, again, a lot of recent stuff, but also a lot of historical stuff. Maybe the oldest story so far is going to be in volume two. Can you can you say the year? I, I believe the 1400s. Oh, my. And it goes all the way to today. So it's a big one. Wow. Ah, color me intrigued. I can't wait. Yeah. Oh, so I have to I have to wait. Probably at least a month before I have the physical copy. And I mean, all things considered, things can happen with with the world right now being the world. So at least a month. And then, you know, potentially like another year before I get to hear about this deep cut 1400s mystery, you have given me motivation to live. And, uh, well. That's why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> I have I I do have a question in regards to switching from a video format to a book. What was that process like for you? Um, it was a bit of a difficult one. Initially, when I was writing it down, I was just writing chapters from the notes I used from my videos, and then afterwards, I kind of tidied it all up and put my own style into it and put in little jokes and references and stuff. So yeah, it took a while. When I started writing it, it was kind of, I didn't have an idea of how I wanted it to be in the end. I just started writing and eventually it all kind of took place and 
yeah, eventually, I guess, kind of found my voice when I was writing it. Yeah, this is the this is the first book that you've uh, you've written. It's the first book I've written. I I've wrote a few kind of screenplays, but I haven't done anything like this before. So this was uh, kind of brand new. A few screenplays. Yeah, yeah. I actually I submitted a feature length screenplay to the BBC earlier in the year, but they haven't got back to me. I I think they're just too amazed. You know, everyone in the office needs to read it. Yeah. Before they respond, so. Uh, yeah, I'm expecting a call about that any day now. <laughs> well, what was the screenplay for? What was it about? Um, it was kind of like a dark comedy. It was um, a little bit, I suppose, like Train Spotting or This Is England. If you've seen those movies, yeah. Only kind of it was set in 2006, and it was about um, the kind of punk alternative scene there. Oh, that'd be awesome! You share some wonderful music on social media because I, you and I are we're both pretty into punk music and my interest in it kind of like I'll find something else. I'll find another, another groove for a while. But like I always come back to, to punk music and yeah, you have personally gotten me back into the current swing. So thank you for that. I, I do love your taste in music as well. It's like uh, we are just unfortunately separated by, you know, an entire ocean. Otherwise, I feel like you and I would be hanging out all the time because you do you tabletop, you, you're into weird stuff, awesome music, mushrooms. I miss your mushroom walks on Instagram. Um, need more of those and just nature stuff. And yeah, dude, like we are cut from the same cloth and I love it. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, it's a shame we're so far apart. We could hang, we could go to gigs. That'd be amazing. <laughs> yeah, there's been some good stuff in Glasgow lately. Yeah. When's the next mushroom walk video or, or series of photos, I should say, coming to Instagram? Hopefully soon. I, I've been out, but I just haven't found any. Bummer. I haven't yeah. been out yet this year because it's been so wet. We've had such a wet early spring with rain. It's been a chore to just do anything outside lately. Um, there's there's standing water in my backyard right now. Trying to kind of get the pool up and going, but you have to wade through the mud and the muck to get to it. So you don't want anybody <laughs> in it anyway. So, uh, but yeah, dude, I, I definitely enjoy everything that you put out. And so I'm not worried at all that I won't enjoy this book. It's going to be tremendous. And I'm glad that you came on the show to, to talk about it. Do you have anything else that you'd like to talk about while you're here? Uh, no, just, um, if you like the chapter I read there, you can read that one and a couple more on uh, Peregrine Coast. There's a little uh, taster. You can also check out, Oh man, we haven't spoke about the cover art. Oh yeah, the yeah. The cover art for the book is something else. Like, uh, we got this. I got this artist, um, Sad Goblin Matt. He's he just nailed it. He knew exactly what to do with very little scrambled information from me. Yeah, absolutely. I'm gonna I want to bring it up and look at it again real quick so I can give my my thoughts. Oh yeah, yeah. I'd love to know what you think because honestly, when I saw the final version, I was blown away. Like, I know it sounds weird because it's my book, but. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I will. Uh, I'll link. Uh, I will link whatever I can to to everyone listening to this in the show notes, so that you can go and find it easily and check it without having to actually even type anything. The cover art, as described by myself, is tremendous. Uh, for one, the centerpiece sort of is uh, the UFO shining the light down on Aleister Crowley in his classic pose. And it's eerie, uh, it's creepy, very stylized in a way that unsettles you just enough. It's kind of that uncanny valley thing with Crowley. He's got the white eyes and like the green on his skin sort of looks like exploded veins and bruises. And we've got all manner of creatures that are featured in, in the stories you've got the floating landmine things uh what was that from what were the landmines from uh, the livingston encounter yes i remember we talked about it the last time you were here because That's of amazing. yeah my my connection with livingston county kentucky we, i remember we specifically talked about it i remember that yeah yeah I still haven't found any floating landmines there. Just for the record, uh, I have been back several times, have not found any floating landmines, but I am always on the lookout for a good floating landmine. The Gurning Man d- down in the bottom right. I assume that's that's a Bigfoot of some type uh, behind the Gurning Man. A Scottish Bigfoot. The yeah. Scottish Bigfoot. Uh, the Scottish Bigfoot. The Grey Man. 
the gray type extraterrestrial looking skeletal figures in the bottom left, what are they from? They're from a couple of stories, and actually they turn up um, two, three times. Yeah, there's uh, A70 Abduction, they're in that one. Um, Zalus as well, they turn up there. Not physically, but their presence is very much known. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, they're classics. And and right behind them is some orange armored looking lobster person type of thing. <laughs> okay, that's going to be the East Kilbride Goblin, which is probably the craziest, most psychedelic cryptid in the book that no one's really heard of. I can only find reference to it, actually, in one book. Awesome. It's, it's a crazy story, though. Just awesome. The description of the creature is one of those ones, you know, where you're like, why would anyone make up this? Like, something so wild. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've heard a few of I was very insistent he'd be on the cover. <laughs> yeah. No, it's terrific. It's terrific. The artwork is, is brilliant, man. Did you include images in the book itself, too, or is it just the cover? Um, every chapter has an illustration, but it's, um, it's from like classic books, classic illustrations, like wood okay. carvings and stuff. Mm-hmm. But yeah, there are pictures in the book, uh, but the art on the cover is its own kind of thing. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, the cover is amazing. So, you know, check it out when you buy it, right? Like, just go buy it and then you have it. And you can get two copies, one to read and one to uh, display for you know, scaring off all of your friends when they come to visit. No, it's tremendous, man. You you definitely picked the right artist for sure. I love the style. Yeah, he's done a lot of um, tabletop RPG kind of art, so it really worked out. Like, the minute I saw some of his stuff, I, I kind of knew this was the guy I needed to do it. Yeah. Uh, when we spoke last on the, on the subject of tabletop RPGs, I think I had mentioned something about uh, a Call of Cthulhu game that my friends and I had had going on for several years. Do you remember that? I do. Yeah. Okay. So I had one of, one of my friends, one of the players come over uh, one night back in the fall and we recorded this, uh, I don't know, hour and a half long description of the first game that we played and tried to sort of retell the story. And unfortunately I don't think it's ever going to make the air. It just did not work out in the way that I hoped it would. It's fun for us to sit, you know, and and reminisce, but I don't think anyone else is ever going to get anything from it. And also there's just some things I just could not put out just, uh, dark, dark things that I was just not prepared (laughs) to share with the world (laughs) that I had kind of forgotten how dark they were because, you know, it's, it's called Cthulhu. It's supposed to be, but like for someone who's stumbling across a casual conversation about ghosts and and aliens and Bigfoot and magic, it's just, uh, it might be too much on the subject of that. It's not going to happen. Um, we are not going to do the full series can't even release release it as a Patreon exclusive. I'm just not I'm not good with it, unfortunately. But it was still fun. It was still fun. Yeah, man, it's such a great game, but um, describing the sessions can get a little bit dark. Yeah, because to the outsiders. <laughs> the thing is, is that it doesn't start just you know full on malevolence and and darkness. Like you have to amp it up. And as as you're playing this game, the same story goes on for, you know, yet, at least two years, I think we played. Like, I was amping things up to a point where I was uncomfortable to even read them. And I was issuing apologies before I, before I would even say what it was I was about to say. I was like, guys, this is really bad, and I'm really sorry, but... <laughs> You know, and so that does not translate well. It just makes me seem like a psychopath, I think. Like, if you're not there and you're not experiencing it and you don't have that longing for something being worse, like, what could possibly be worse than what he's already done? You know, like, yeah, it's it paints me in a very bad light and it's made me rethink my life. Yeah, you gotta get those players to take those sanity checks, though. You gotta gotta give them worse and worse stuff. (laughs) Oh, yeah, absolutely. I did find when I was going through all this stuff, I found, uh, like, I made this this list that had, I think, 80 different random phobias and uh, sanity issues. So, if somebody actually had lost enough sanity to have, you know, something develop, that they would roll a D20 
and a D4, and they would pick from one of the D4 would signify which list of the D20 that they were going to get that effect from. And some of them were just absolutely ridiculous. And I was remembering two sessions where they'd come up like one of them was you are absolutely terrified of the fog that is enveloping the group no matter where you go. (laughs) <laughs> and they would, you know, and so it would be debilitating that, you know, they'd have effects of that on their roles and they would role play it, you know, and no one else knew. Like I would write it on a little slip of paper and hand it to them and they they didn't know. So it makes it more fun, you know, it was a lot of fun and I do miss it. We haven't been able to play because everybody's just working all the time trying to recover in this economy. You know, I think uh, there's been this sort of corporate greed thing uh where these companies all think that because we didn't make money for a year that we have to make more money now than we ever have in our entire lives and it's definitely crippling uh people's mental health it's it's very rough here right now yeah i can't say it's a lot better over here it's a uh, same kind of mentality yeah it's unfortunate it when you have things like that, people don't have time to relax or, or have fun or partake in activities such as reading or movies or any type of entertainment. And that stifles people creatively, you know? And maybe that's what they want. Maybe that's the overarching conspiracy. Man, I think I'd be giving them too much credit. Yeah, you're probably right. I think it's just greed. <laughs> but, <laughs> so, <laughs> how how are the recovery efforts in Scotland right now? We've just kind of, in America, have started to pretend that COVID-19 was never a thing. It never happened. And we don't know where all these people went. Yeah, I mean, kind of the same. Yeah, uh, It seems like every day, everything just went back to normal. And uh, we just pretended it didn't exist anymore, you know? Yeah. It's weird. So it was a bit of a weird one. It is weird. How how are you adjusting? You know, I know you spend a lot of time, you know, out in the presence of other people. What's it like for you? It's not too bad. I mean, most people I'm around in the the places I go, people are generally quite sensible, you know. Yeah. Yeah, the general public. I don't know. I prefer being with uh with my own punks and role players and uh, paranormal weirdos. Yeah. <laughs> They're the ones that get that uh kind of know what it's all about. We're the best people. Oh yeah, we <laughs> absolutely. Are. No other, no other group with such niche interests as tabletop gaming, punk rock music, and the occult will ever come close to our sensibility. Yeah, it doesn't sound like that would be the case, but here we are. <laughs> I think it's it's our ability to uh, I don't know separate the bullshit, so to speak. You know, from from our experience and from our reality. And in a way, the punk rock music comes from sort of that, to me, it comes from that sort of sense of, you know, that rebellion. And if you have a sense of rebellion, that means you have a sense of what's going on, right? And so, you can't rebel against something if you're just blindly following the masses. So, you have that critical thinking aspect to your personality. Uh, Tabletop role-playing games are a prime example of creativity, artistic appreciation, imagination you don't have that without some sort of you know sensibility and ability to translate those things all into one singular outlet and then with the occult i mean no one who isn't of sound mind is going to be able to find anything in it that they can't just write off you have to be able to critically analyze what you read or find to say well does this line up is this is this legit or is this, you know, just bullshit to, you know, to con people? So, yeah, it does make sense in a way. If you really break it down and think about it, that that people with these interests are very sensible. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I just think from the outside, obviously, they're quite uh, non-mainstream interests. I oh, think, yeah. Uh, no, absolutely. People have certain um, conceptions of it and then, you know, not always true, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. That's why we're fun. That's why we're oh, fun, Mark. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, okay. I will put links to the book. I will put links. Also put the link to the, to the YouTube channel, even though, um, you are lacking there and you need to get back on it, sir. Uh, and I will definitely make sure to put the cover art on the website if that's okay with you. Oh, absolutely. That way, if you want to see it without looking things up and, and clicking a bunch of links, just go to paranormalpatio.com. It will be right there. 
in the show notes on the website so you can have a look at the picture and pick it up. Martin, thank you so much for coming on the show, my friend. I have been very excited to talk to you. And then whenever we uh, decided to do this kind of short notice, uh, it has been what I've been looking forward to for the week. And that includes the new Nicolas Cage movie that I watched last night. This was uh, more exciting to me in planning uh, than the new Nicolas Cage movie, which was tremendous, by the way. I was uh, going to ask. I haven't had a chance to check it out yet, but um, I really, really want to. So it is uh, wonderful. There are so many intended cliches. It just drives the narrative in a way that's very unique. I laughed very hard. I was captivated by the action, which was really well done. And it's Nicolas Cage. So he of definitely, uh, every aspect of Nicolas Cage is represented here, I think. And I think you'll really enjoy it if you're a Nick Cage fan. I, I have one question about it. Okay, yeah. Does he wear the snakeskin jacket from Wild at Heart at any point. I, I don't want to say anything about that, Martin. Oh! That's like my favorite jacket of all time. I will say there are definitely some classic Nick Cage throwbacks there for you. Oh, yeah. I'm going to need to go see it now. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I think you'll love it. It's just great. It's <laughs> not, it's not a, you know, like a cinematic masterpiece. You know what you're going to get when you go in, but I loved every second of it. Uh, there was not one minute where I was like, this was a bad decision. You know, like it was just really well done. It wasn't like the recent Nick Cage independent movies, which are actually really good. It was definitely felt like a, how do I want to word this? It felt like a studio representation of a typical movie, but with the content of the independent Nick Cage films. Yeah, that does sound pretty excellent. It was really good. They gave him a lot of faith and a lot of uh, expectations of him being Nick Cage, and it was tremendous. I can't think of many other actors that kind of project would work for. No, I thought about that while I was watching it. I was like, there's no one else that could do this movie. There's absolutely no one else. Maybe Shatner in the 80s. Maybe. Ugh, I don't think so. I don't think you'll have that opinion no. when you watch it. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's it's great. Definitely go. Uh, watch I'll it. definitely need to check out. Yes. And so that brings us to the end of this episode. And uh thank you so much, man, for stopping in and for the exclusive chapter reading. Come on. Uh thanks. Thanks for having me back on. It was uh, fun to finally kinda read it out loud. I hope I hope everyone enjoys it and I didn't mess it up too much. Oh no, you did great, man. Absolutely great. And I want to be notified. In case I miss it, I have a lot going on. So whenever you get some information, you let me know about getting this book. Terrific. Yeah, well, hopefully we can uh, talk again, maybe after it comes out. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, I'd like to definitely know, you know, how well it's doing, how, what kind of uh, reception you're getting from it, you know, that type of thing. So, absolutely. Yes, exciting time. So, hopefully, hopefully a warm reception. I'm sure it will be. I'm sure it will be because <laughs> that first that first chapter is pretty good, man. It's pretty good. Oh, thank you. I'm really glad that you enjoy it. Thank you, everybody, for listening. See you on the next one. Until next time, keep the fire going.